Hello everyone and welcome to this introductory lecture on microbial ecology. My name is Kirsten Elegard and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. I work in the lab of uh, Professor Philip Engel and in our lab we study the bacteria that colonize the gut of the honeybee. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about these bacteria in my second lecture. But in this first lecture, I would like to start by just giving you a brief overview of what microbial ecology is all about. So microbial life on Earth is actually something that we are still in the process of discovering. We've known about microbes for almost 400 years since the first microscopes were invented. But it's only within the last couple of decades with the advent of new molecular methods that we have started to get a better appreciation of the diversity of microbial life on Earth. So what I'm showing you in this slide is an illustration of the Tree of Life as it was published in 2016. So the Tree of Life aims at telling us how all living organisms are related to each other. And so as animals, we are down here at the bottom of the tree within the eukaryotes. But actually plants and animals represent a tiny, tiny fraction of this tree. Most of the diversity in the tree is generated by the bacteria up here at the top. And in fact, many of the branches in this tree have only been discovered during the last 10 years. So just because we can't see the microbes doesn't mean that they are not abundant or important. Take the ocean, for example. Just one milliliter of seawater, you're likely to find more than 100,000 microbial cells. And one of the bacteria you are likely to find in such a sample is Prochlorococcus. This bacterium is incredibly abundant and it does photosynthesis. In fact, it's been estimated that Prochlorococcus is responsible for 5% of the global photosynthesis. Another habitat where there is a lot of microbes is the soil. In one gram of soil, you will typically find more than one billion microbial cells. And these microbial communities are very important for soil health. They play a role in nutrient cycling, they're decomposers. And some of them also form associations with plants, colonize the roots of plants and fix nitrogen. And so for these plants, these bacteria are incredibly important. In fact, many bacteria are known to form associations with animals and plants. In this slide, I just wanted to give you a few examples of such associations. So here to the left, you see a lovely little family of pea aphids. Now aphids, they can survive on a diet that consists only of plant sap. And the way they can do that is because they carry a bacterium that synthesizes the essential amino acids that they need. Another interesting example is the bobtail squid has actually become a bit of a model for symbiosis research. The bobtail squid carries a specialized light organ that is filled with bacteria and these bacteria generate light and by doing that they provide camouflage for the squid when it goes hunting for prey at night. A third example that lies really close to my heart is Bulbachia. So this bacterium has been estimated to infect almost a third of all arthropod species. And it colonizes the germline cells of its host. So in this image here, you're looking at a Drosophila egg and all the little green dots here are Wolbachia cells. And Wolbachia has become particularly famous because it very often manipulates the reproduction of its host. And one of the phenotypes you can see is things like feminization or male killing. Now, in addition to these quite intimate one-on-one -on -one associations, most animals and plants also form associations with complex bacterial communities, also known as microbiomes. And so a famous example is the gut microbiome. And we know that the gut microbiome is very important for animal health, for development and for nutrition. So within the last couple of decades, it's become apparent that most bacteria live in very complex communities with many different species. But we still know very little about the ecology of such communities. 
why do some communities have more species than others? And how do these species coexist within the communities? Do they compete? Do they collaborate? Maybe a little bit of both. And what makes them stable over time? How do they get established in the first place? This is uh, particularly important when we talk about host associated communities, such as the gut microbiota, because we are not born with our gut bacteria, we have to acquire them. And it's very important for us that we get the right bacteria. So microbial ecology is, uh, is a research field that is becoming very important, not just in its own right, but also because it has many possible applications for our society. If we can understand how bacteria function in communities, maybe we can come up with solutions for how to promote animal health and nutrition or more environmental friendly ways of dealing with wastewater or contaminated soils and just in general finding biological solutions as alternatives to more toxic chemical ones. So how can we study bacterial communities? Well, for a long time, there was only these two options. Either you look at them with the microscope or you try to isolate your bacteria and culture them in the lab. Now, both of these methods have, are continue to be very important, but unfortunately, the reality is that most of the bacteria out there are unculturable. Or more precisely, we don't know how to culture these bacteria and it's a lot of hard work to find out. So therefore it's been very important for the field to come up with methods that doesn't involve culturing. And one of those methods uh, that have been developed and that has been very important is known as 16S rRNA profiling. So the 16S rRNA gene is a very important gene. All bacteria have it and they cannot live without it. It's part of the ribosome, which is responsible for translating RNA into protein. And so it's extremely conserved. And because of that, it has become possible to generate primers to amplify this gene directly from an environmental sample. So in this slide, I have just given you an outline of how the method works. Of course, it starts by you collecting a sample then you need to extract DNA from the bacteria in the sample. And then you do a PCR amplification, so you amplify a little fragment of the 16S RNA gene, and then you sequence the PCR product. And by doing this, you can get an appreciation of which bacteria were present in the sample and also their relative abundances. Now, by now, there are thousands and thousands of publications that have used this method. And there's also some global initiatives that have emerged, such as the Earth Microbiome Project. This is a collaboration of researchers from all around the world. And the ambitious aim is to map out all microbial life on Earth. And so a lot of samples have been collected by now from all kinds of environments. And we've already learned a few things. So, as stated already, bacterial communities are incredibly diverse, and that makes it difficult to find any patterns in their composition. But some patterns have emerged. So one of the important determinants of which bacteria you will find is to do with whether the bacterial community is free living, such as from the ocean, or host associated, such as, for example, from the gut of an animal. And then there's other environmental factors that are of importance. For free living bacteria, salinity is known to be important. For host associated bacteria, it also matters which part of the animal or plant that the bacteria colonize. One of the things that don't seem to matter much is where the samples came from, so geography. So in short, a lot of really exciting insights have been obtained using 16S profiling. But there are some limitations with these methods. Now, one of the challenges is to do with the fact that bacteria are promiscuous. Now, what I mean by that is that bacteria are actually capable of exchanging genes with each other, also known as horizontal gene transfer. You may have heard about antibiotic resistance becoming a big problem now. 
one of the reasons why it's so hard to do something about it is because antibiotic resistance genes are an example of a kind of a gene that is very easily transferred around among bacteria. But there are many other genes being transferred around. And so when we talk about bacterial genomes, we often talk about the core genome and the pan genome or accessory genome. So the core genome is defined as the genes that are shared by all members of a given bacterial species. But in addition to these core genes that they all have, bacteria also carry other genes that may or may not be present in a given bacterial species. So bacteria are incredibly flexible in terms of gene content. And therefore, when you do 16S profiling, Although you may get an idea of which bacteria are present, you will not know which genes they carry. For that, you need another method. And one such method that can give you this information is metagenomics. Metagenomics works as follows, quite simple really. You collect your sample, you extract DNA, just as you do with 16S profiling. But instead of doing a PCR, you just sequence everything. And so by doing that, you get DNA from the genomes of your bacteria and not just from the 16S genome. Now, that means that you need to sequence a lot deeper to get a good coverage of your community. So it's much more expensive. And also it makes the analysis quite complicated. But there are some important advantages. Using metagenomic data, you can ask the question, who is there? Just as you can with 16S profiling, but you will get a much higher resolution telling about even very closely related bacterial species. You can also say something about diversity, even as it occurs within bacterial species, something that you cannot do with 16S profiling. And finally, as I already stated, metagenomics will give you information about the genes that the bacteria carry, not just the species that they belong to. I will talk more about metagenomics in my second lecture, but for now, to wrap up this first lecture, here are some take home messages. So microorganisms are incredibly diverse and there is still a lot to explore. We know that micro communities have a major impact on many ecosystems. Now microbial ecology is still a new research field and there is actually many unanswered questions at this point. And in order to address these questions, we need to use molecular methods.